I'd like to focus your attention on a question, seven words long, came from the lips of the Lord himself in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 14. In the days when Sarah laughed because she couldn't believe that as an old lady she was going to bear a son. And the Lord responded to Abram when he heard her laugh and he said, is anything too hard for the Lord? We are used to living in a world of cause and effect, and we know that there's a relative relationship between, shall we say, the size of the cause and the effect that it produces. But God existed before there was any world, and he is the ultimate cause for everything. And if he so chooses to act in ways that are contrary to what we think are the natural laws of cause and effect, he is quite capable of doing this. Well, I was sitting beside one of the prisoners uh, in one of our local prisons last uh, week, and as we talked, he said to me, are you associated with those known as the brethren? And I said, why would you ask that? Well, he said, the brethren have a, a certain seriousness about the word of God that you don't see everywhere. And uh, so we talked a little bit, and I discovered that his own mother. They had been raised Roman Catholic. He had been saved in the Air Force and called his mother. She had cut him off for a whole year. And then um, she became deeply concerned about her soul. Living in Houston, she found a, a little church that spoke Spanish. And to her amazement, the elders of the church came from Argentina, which was their home country. And uh, she soon discovered that they were also known as those known as brethren. Now, of course, there are different groups, a church of the brethren and brethren in Christ and so on. But but this uh, little group of believers, very often small and unnoticed, very few of them recognize an official pastor over the church. They gather encouraging the men who are gifted to take uh, part in the teaching of the word and so on. Uh, people who are somewhat associated with them think that they all came from the life and preaching of John Nelson Darby. This is not the case. I don't want to speak ill of Mr. Darby. Um, he was involved in certain contentious issues. Uh, nonetheless, for 26 years, he traveled the hills and dales of Ireland and France and Switzerland and Italy and Germany, um, preaching the gospel and uh, saw sometimes 100, 200 people saved in a week. And during that time, translated the Bible into English and French and German. And so while he's known for some controversies, until I've done similar, I'm not sure, I'm, uh, I'll let him stand before the Lord and uh, have an assessment of his ministry, just as I'll be responsible for mine. Nonetheless, the group of believers that I grew up among, and many such churches in our area, and they don't trace themselves back to Mr. Darby, but actually a group of young evangelists who worked in the northeast of Scotland. They were known as the Northeast Coast Mission, and uh, their intention was to get out the gospel. But as they led people to Christ and encouraged them to search the scriptures, they saw the truth of believers' baptism. And many churches in that part of Scotland did not practice believers' baptism. In fact, they despised it. And then um, they saw the truth of the priesthood of all believers, um, that every believer is a priest, and the idea that the Christians in the early days every week gathered simply around the bread and wine to have the Lord's Supper. And so these new converts came to these men and said, where do we attend? Where do we get into the fellowship of a local church where they practice these things? Christ as the practical head of the church, not some denominational system that looks to an earthly headquarters, and so on. And so they they really backed into meeting as local churches. Their, their intention was not to start a new group of churches. Eventually, these men came to Canada and the United States and faithfully preached the gospel, and over a period of of 30 or 40 years, they saw hundreds of gatherings of believers similar to those in Scotland. And I had the privilege of growing up in such a local church. 
Many of the people in that region were Scottish as well, some first, second, third generation, because there was uh, shipbuilding there in, in my town, and these were shipbuilders from, or fishermen from Scotland. And so they came to the New World, they were attracted to these places. The same is true of the coal mines in southern Iowa and in Colorado. The same was true of the knitting mills that were very um, ubiquitous in, in New England. Uh, they came from these sorts of things back in the old country, and so they gravitated to the same areas in, in this country. And so um, they've carried on in much weakness, it's true. Um, and um, they sometimes are known more for sort of idiosyncrasies because uh, they teach the head covering for the women and they they have this idea that it, it doesn't matter whether you go to a, a college to study the Word of God. If you do or don't, you have to learn it from the Holy Spirit anyway. And so they speak often of St. Mary's College, in other words, sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus. And so they were renowned in many ways for their loyalty to Christ, their loyalty to the Word of God, their love of preaching the gospel, and their desire to remember the Lord in the breaking of bread. Well, quite some years ago in Britain, there was a desire to compile some books that described much of the missionary enterprise of those who were sent out. And many people uh, who might recognize names like Harry Ironside or William MacDonald or um, Jim Elliott and the, the martyrs uh, in Ecuador, George Mueller, the great man of faith, may not recognize that these were people who associated with those known as brethren. Now, they didn't take the name for themselves. Just like the Quakers and the Shakers and the Lollards and the Friends of God and the Waldensians and the Moravians and so on. Uh, these were pejorative terms, just like Anabaptist was. This was not a name they took to themselves. In the early days, they said, well, who, who are you people? Well, we're just brethren. Oh, you're the brethren. No, no, there's one Lord and we're all brethren. They didn't want to build uh, walls, they wanted to build bridges, and yet somehow they were given this as an exclusive title, and that's not the intention at all. Uh, in any case, uh, the man who was, I believe, the director of the British Atomic Energy Commission, he was uh, given the task of gathering together this series. His name was Frederick Tatford, and this is a complete series of books um, there are 10 of them that cover each of the continents and some of the Muslim world and the islands of the sea and so on, a fairly extensive study. Now, it doesn't tell the whole story, of course, but it does a magnificent job of introducing all of these unnamed people, people unknown to church history largely, who went out with the word of God, who preached the gospel, and who saw many souls saved. They were not interested in titles. They were not interested in getting attention or getting glory to themselves, empire building. They just wanted to get out the gospel, see people saved, see them gather together as simple gatherings of believers, recognizing local elder rulership and uh, gathering uh, around the Lord, gathering at the Lord's Supper and proclaiming the gospel. So, um, as a result of this visit with my friend, he was very interested in what happened in Argentina and how the work of God spread there. And I was explaining to him that what happened was the British came to Argentina and largely set up the rail system and the banking system. And uh, as they went from place to place, many of them were associated with those known as brethren. And uh, so they would uh, begin to evangelize and see people saved, not always... Um, full-time preachers. Many of them had full employment with the rail service or with the banks, but wherever they went, they shared the gospel, they saw people saved and gathered together. And so um, it's a, a quite a remarkable story of what God did. Well, in this book on, um, uh, it's called uh, The Dawn Over Latin America, there's a 
chapter, quite a lengthy chapter, on Argentina. As I was going through it, I read this story about a man named John Henry L. Ewan, who was really the first from these gatherings of believers who felt burdened to take the gospel to Argentina. And uh, he had no financial resources. He was not looking to any mission society. He was looking alone to the Lord. The chapter describes him as a not outstandingly robust physically. He was not one of exceptional ability or attractive presence, all right? So, but he had a heart and he wanted to reach out in the gospel. So, he he had read about the need there and he thought, we need to get out there with the gospel because these countries are going to grow. There's going to be emigration. There's lots of talk of wealth in those lands and uh, people are going to flood there. Not always the best people who are attracted to sudden wealth. And so we need to get in there with a foothold for the gospel. At that time, the land was largely Roman Catholic and many people did not know the truth of the gospel. And so uh, through a mutual contact, he began to write letters to a certain Frederick Fletcher who lived in Argentina. Let me read a little bit here. Frederick wrote that it was a land of tremendous possibilities, and he was personally enjoying considerable prosperity. Uh, he was concerned about the spiritual needs of the people, and, and he said, I think they're open to the gospel, but there's no one to present the claims of Christ to them. And so Ewan took this as some encouragement, and he began to write back and tell about his own particular burden to come. And then we read, weeks passed, and then Fletcher wrote again, saying quite simply that if Ewan was prepared to come, he would be ready to support him financially. Other letters passed back and forth, and Ewan decided that this was God speaking and that he would go to Argentina. And so he wrote one final letter to Fletcher, packed his bags, told Fletcher, this is in early 1882, he told Fletcher that uh, he would be arriving in Argentina in a particular week. Well, his departure was delayed for a whole week. If it hadn't been, he would have received another letter from Fletcher who said, I'm sorry, but I have faced financial ruin. I've lost my business, and um, I'm afraid I won't be able to help you financially. <laughs> but he didn't get that letter, nor did Fletcher get the letter that he had sent telling him when his boat would arrive in Buenos Aires. And so they were both, as it were, flying in the dark. The one thought that uh, there was someone waiting to fund his missionary enterprise, and on the other hand, the other brother, Fletcher, had no idea that Brother Ewan was on his way. Well, so he goes on to say, when the ship landed, there was no one to meet the new worker, and he didn't know what to do. Now, he spoke no Spanish, all right? Two porters, seeing him stranded on the quayside, asked in Spanish if he would like them to take his bags. Not knowing what was said, he allowed them to shoulder his bags and followed them. It was a long way into the city, and after walking some distance, the porters asked him, again in Spanish, the address to which he was going. Again, he couldn't make any reply. In disgust, the men set down his luggage and left him on the road. With no knowledge of Spanish and no means of getting to the city, Ewan sat on his trunk and prayed that the Lord would meet his need. A man who was passing was arrested by the unusual sight and accosted him, and in English. A few words soon revealed. It was Frederick Fletcher, who had been totally unaware that his young friend was on his way to the country. In a very short space of time, all problems were solved, he found accommodation, provided financial help while the young man was learning the language, and then planned how they could set about evangelizing the area in which he was living. And so Ewan, strange as it may seem, who spoke no Spanish, began to travel the country preaching in English. 
And there were people who would translate for him. And the people were curious. Many who had never heard the gospel. And they responded. And then after some time, he was quite ill, uh, had many repeated attacks of ill health. He kept at it, traveling far and wide, and then returned to England. But he wouldn't rest on his furlough. He said, I must get the word out because we need to see people flooding to Argentina with the gospel, people who are better equipped than I am to take the gospel. And as a result, there were scores of people who heard him, good quality people who knew the Lord and knew the word and uh, were willing to sacrifice. And they traveled there and, and using uh, horse carts and various means, they traveled way up into the mountains and, and into these regions in Argentina with the gospel. And soon, hundreds of gatherings of local churches. Soon, uh, there are now over 400 gatherings of believers like this who gather in simplicity and who share the gospel wherever they go. And so that's just one little story of a dear man who took to heart the words of Genesis 18.14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? You know, the Lord wants to prove this in our lives. He wants each of us to have our own stories, not just stories of long ago and far away about Brother Ewan, but that in each of our lives, uh, we would cast ourselves on God. You see, here's the problem. We, we isolate ourselves from God working. You know, we can get all insured up and we can have everything thought of. And, uh, you know, what would have happened to Job if he'd had insurance? Uh, he lost everything, and then he calls up the insurance company, so many camels, so many this, so many that. Yep, got it covered, fine, end of story. God wants us to be open to him so that he can act on our behalf and prove himself to us. And so we too can discover that nothing is too hard for the Lord.